The last thing I want to talk about in Lecture 7 is the idea of the Van't Hoff equation. Uh, this is to be distinguished from the Van't Hoff factor that we learned about when we were looking at colligative properties. Same Van't Hoff, but entirely different idea. The Van't Hoff equation is a profoundly important equation that allows us to relate the temperature dependence of chemical equilibrium. Um, as I show you the Van't Hoff equation right here, the first thing that should stick in your head is, wow, I've seen that equation before, haven't I, or at least something like it? And in fact, you have. Um, the Clausius-Clapeyron equation was derived in the very first lecture for this course. And in that Clausius-Clapeyron equation, we were ratioing pressures, not equilibrium concentration ratios, but pressures. Still, the rest of the expression was the same. We had a delta H of reaction term. We had our two temperatures that we were talking about. With the Clausius-Clapeyron equation, if you gave me one temperature and one vapor pressure, I could predict, given a second temperature, a second vapor pressure. I even showed you how to derive that expression. So having shown you how to derive Clausius-Clapeyron, I'm going to humor you by not deriving Van't Hoff, but it's done in exactly the same way, and you end up with the following kind of result. Given two temperatures, you can predict two equilibrium constant values. Or, if I give you a temperature and a K value, and then a new temperature, you can tell me a new K value for it. So this is the Van Toff equation. You'll notice that um, it's got a lot of stuff we need to work with here, including this log function, the ability to extract these um, um, inverse, uh, these reciprocal temperatures here. And so there's um, a considerable amount of algebra you'll be asked to do. Um, either fortunately or unfortunately, because in this class we aren't using calculators, you don't get to solve your way out of it just by sticking in a bunch of numbers and solving for something else. You're actually going to have to understand this equation pretty fundamentally. Um, so to get started on that, let's take a look at delta H for the reaction. Delta H for the reaction is exactly that. It's that bomb calorimetry measurement that you can get. This is either exothermic or endothermic for its result. Now, having shown you that, something you should appreciate is that there are many forms in which you will see the Van't Hoff equation. You will see it written with T1 first and T2 second. Sometimes you'll see it written with T2 first and T1 second. Sometimes you'll see it written with K2 on top and K1 down below, sometimes with K on, K1 on top and K2 down below, and either with a plus sign in front or the minus sign in front of delta H. So there are like six different ways you can write this thing. And so um, to appreciate that mathematically this is legitimate, if you'd like, you can go through the exercise that if you take 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2 and you flip it around, that you can fix that simply by putting a negative sign here. Or that if you take K1 and put up top and K2 down below, that you can fix that by putting a negative sign right here. I'm not going to go to that trouble. I'm going to try to the best of my ability to keep this consistently the same value here, K2 over K1, T1 minus T2, and a positive value here. But don't be surprised if when you work problems or when you're uh, looking through different kinds of books, if you don't come across the Van't Hoff equation being written in slightly different forms. Assume that they're writing it correctly, and just make sure that your starting and your finishing um, K and T values are lined up correctly, and you'll be fine. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is the ability to relate it back to Le Chatelier's principle. Mathematically, I can stick the numbers in to be able to figure this out, but if you'll recall from the previous examples I showed you, when we had exothermic cases, um, notice that, for example, in this exothermic case, because heat was produced here on the right-hand side, if I were to heat this reaction up, what would that do? It would shift the reaction to the left. What would that do to my K value? That would make my K value go down. So with exothermic cases, as I um, heat the system up, the reaction shifts to the left. You will see that the same sort of result comes out of this, out of this reaction here. As I increase the value of the temperature for an exother exothermic process, it ends up making K2 be a smaller number. Consider another possibility. Here's my endothermic case here. Suppose I decide to heat this system up. By heating this system up here, which is endothermic, I will be shifting the system to the right and K will be getting larger. Mathematically, the same thing happens over here. In this particular case, if I decide to increase the temperature for a reaction which is now endothermic, 
then this is going to result in K2 being larger, not smaller. I tell you this right now because it's really important that you keep these ideas in mind. They will keep you from actually having to be able to solve this problem mathematically. Um, I may simply be asking you to look at the Van Toff equation and tell me what happened to K? Did it go up or down when the temperature changed? And in your head you're thinking, wait, this is just a Le Chatelier's principle problem. Did you say that delta H was endothermic? Well, delta H is endothermic. That must mean that the reaction is going to be shifting to the right when the temperature goes up. Therefore, my K value is going to be getting larger. If you can think your way through a problem like that, then this problem here becomes a lot easier to deal with. And even if you are having to do the math for it, it's going to help you be able to predict whether or not your K values are um, coming out higher or lower and that it makes sense mathematically with respect to this expression.